Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, praising you that we're able to to so stand because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We praise you that we are able to feast upon your word. We're keenly aware of just how little we know and, and how majestic and sovereign that you are. May the Holy Spirit take charge of this video and my handling of your word. I ask you strip away that which is foolish and error, but just seal to our hearts, our understanding, only that which is true. And I ask you this in Christ's name. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Colossians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were in chapter 1, uh, somewhere around verse 13. It seems like a, a tremendous responsibility to handle the Word of God and not handle it deceitfully. Folks, I long to know what these passages say, and, and I'm greatly concerned that we not be led astray from the truth of the passage by some foolishness of my own. I believe that we are dealing with very serious passages of Scripture. And when I say that, I don't mean to infer that some uh, parts of God's Word are not serious. And I wonder just, you know, how much that we blaspheme His holy name when we're unwilling to comprehend what has been done for us in Christ. In fact, that's the basically the very purpose behind this entire ministry is that we understand these things. To understand our identity in Christ and what He has done for us. We came to the 13th verse who delivered us from the power of the, the darkness, of darkness. Now, that's an aorist middle. He did that for himself, and he did it once. He's not in the process of doing that. This is not something that, that needs to be done over and over and over again. This isn't something which is based upon human merit. You know, and, and you may deserve it today and not deserve it tomorrow. The very tense of the verb, folks, looks back to the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has delivered us from the authority of the darkness, and He's translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. I pointed out, I believe, in my last video. And he, He's done that. That's an aorist indicative active. He did it. We didn't do it. And I want you to take note that not only in this verse, but no place in the passage, no place, can you introduce the idea of human synergism or human merit. He doesn't say that he did this if, you know, you wanted him to. You know, if you decided that, you know, uh, he ought to do it, you know, or if you ask him to do it, if you received him or anything else. There's nothing in the passage that would direct your attention to some moment in your life when you made a decision. But the text, rather, directs your attention to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And I think that the 14th verse is an elaboration on that. In whom, it's, it's in the vocative case in the grammar, the word uh, is in whom, in the sphere of Christ, we have the redemption. It's articulated. The forgiveness. The word forgive is used 
has a translation for several Greek words. The release of the sin. We need to be aware of the fact that God does not change and that God judges sin. I don't know how many Christians I know who are always constantly concerned about God judging them in regard to sin. Folks, listen to me very, very carefully, please. I, I beg you, and I don't believe I've ever said that in any video. That judgment either rests on the individual or on Christ. And the problem, I think, from the, the Christian standpoint is that we have been so freely given all of the riches of His glory in Christ that it becomes easy for us to look at sin either casually on the one hand or or not really truly consider just what Christ did for us in relationship to sin. Surely when we use the word redemption, which is many of you who know me uh, know that that is a, such a precious word in my vocabulary. When we use that word, our minds must immediately, immediately revert to what God has done for us in Christ and what it cost God. Folks, don't lose sight of the fact of what it cost God to write these precious words. And so many of the verses that follow are going to be devoted to the magnitude of this work that results in our completeness in Christ. It's in Christ, not in the way we live, not in the fellowship of this tiny band of followers here on YouTube or, or Facebook or, or anywhere else, but in Christ that we constantly have the redemption. When you use the word redemption, I think of the person in the work of my Savior. We constantly have the redemption, is what the text says. I believe the author, the Holy Spirit, articulated the word so that we would not in any way link redemption to our manner of life or our mental attitude. Further, the text clearly says we always have it. It isn't something that comes and goes. If your Christian life is based upon your faithfulness, your manner of life, your dedication, or whatever, just fill in the blank. If it's dependent upon you, then it is a life of many highs and many lows. It's an uneven and in many ways uh, an unhappy walk. But we have that equilibrium because we know that it is not of us, that the surpassing power, the greatness of the, the excellency is, is of, of Christ, not ourselves. We always have the redemption. We always have the release from the sins. Now, many of you followed me through Ephesians. If you remember in Ephesians, there was a time when we walked according to the course of this world. The word course there is age. We walked according to the age of the world. There is an ecclesiastical environment. There is an ecclesiastical environment. Okay, that's the environment that was in, in view there in Ephesians. According to the prince of the power of the air, one controlling the ecclesiastical environment from whom the Lord Jesus Christ purchased the world system. The spirit that now works within the children of the disobedient. The word is sons, not children. It's not, it's not technon. In the Greek, it's the word, and the word spirit there is not Satan, it's the spirit of the age, and that's the way we walked. We walked like, like them, we walked like the sons of the disobedience. 
that passage does not say that you are a son of disobedience. That passage says that you walked like those in whom the spirit of that disobedience works. That's how you once walked. In Ephesians, as well as Colossians, we find that we were delivered from that. We were translated from that area of authority to the area of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet many of my Christian friends seem to believe that we were translated from the authority uh, of the spirit of the, the disobedience to some kind of personal responsibility where that we, we may or we may not uh, go to heaven. You know, we'll put everything on the scale and we'll just hope that, you know, that the scale moves, the, gets tipped, you know, the right way so that we can enter heaven. But we were not translated from one area of authority into our own, folks, get this, okay, but into his. And we will soon see that he's the head, the supreme authority. And it's in Christ that we constantly have the redemption being set free being pulled out being purchased back we were bought we were bought with a price and we know that what that price was the release of these sins in Romans 6 we read sin shall not have dominion over you you're not under law but under grace it's because that we're not under law but under grace that sin shall not have dominion over us, folks. There exists a, uh, I guess, what, you know, what you'd call a segment of society today who are under law and sin. And sin shall have dominion over them. Okay? I believe because of Adam's transgression and because of, of personal sin, condemnation rests upon all men. They've already been condemned. Now, to a certain segment, God's children, that condemnation was transferred to Jesus Christ. But don't get the idea that God changed, you know, and there wasn't any condemnation. There was. It, it's either you or Christ. And to belittle what Christ did to me, folks, is to, to I don't know how to put it, well, it's, it's to, to tamper with holy ground. Those who are his family always have the redemption and the release from the dominion of the sin. Okay? The, that's why I believe it's they're both articulated. The sin, as in that sin singular, folks, okay, as in the old sinful nature, in its entirety, the old man that can do nothing but sin, that which we are to reckon ourselves dead to, Romans 6.11. I don't think that the 14th verse here is saying that, that God forgives your sin. You have a scriptural... Uh, thesis that says that or, that God is not imputing trespasses unto you. And you'll soon be told in Colossians, just as you were in Ephesians, you know, the second chapter of Ephesians, fourth chapter of Colossians, that you have already been judicially forgiven of, of all sin. There isn't one that you've ever committed or ever will commit that has not already been forgiven. It's, it's amazing how I, I still have people that I, I love dearly. These are brothers and sisters in the Lord that still write me today. And they'll, they'll, they'll say something. They'll ask me something like, do you think so-and-so is going to heaven? Because he's not exactly walking the way he should. Folks, listen to me. There isn't one sin that you've ever committed or ever will commit that he's not already forgiven you of. But that's not the subject of the 14th verse. I believe the subject of the 14th verse is the release from the dominion of sin, that it won't have dominion over you. And many of my 
these same people they they, they look at this person and they see so all this garbage in their life and they think well sin must have dominion over that person no it doesn't it doesn't have dominion it may appear to to in through your eyes that that that's the case but the text says that, sh that sin shall not have dominion over us why because we're not under law but, but under grace and you're just putting that bro that bl brother or that sister under law the verse isn't saying that you won't commit sin neither is the verse saying that when you commit them god will forgive them i mean he does and he has but that's not what this verse says this verse is an extension of the translation that you have experienced from the authority of the darkness to the kingdom of the son of his love you've been taken from one place and placed in another and so in that sense you are delivered from the dominion of sin Context is not a deliverance from committing sins, but from the dominion of sin. You go on then to the 15th verse. It's in Christ that we have this. The sphere, the location. Verse 14 is in Christ. Who is Christ? And I think without question, in Colossians 1, you have... You have Folks, in Colossians chapter 1, you have the greatest, I believe. Now, it's just my personal opinion. Take it for what it's worth. You have the greatest theological statement of the person and the work of Christ that occurs any place in the whole Word of God. I'm talking about Old Testament and New And the thing that's of great interest to me is that it consumes only a very few verses. Now, of course, I have to admit, I've, I've noticed God seems to pack a whole lot in to just a few words in other places as well. But the text says that in the sphere of Christ, we have the redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And I don't think they're synonyms. But but truths that will be expounded upon or expanded in this epistle we are not under sin's dominion and we do have a redemption that redemption made it necessary for jesus christ to become incarnate in human flesh to die on the cross be buried and, and rise again from the dead and no matter what tinge of human logic would say well you know well he didn't have to do that you know the truth is he did God Almighty condemned sin and that condemnation either rests up upon Jesus Christ or on the individual that's why the Lord Jesus Christ said the one who does not believe has been condemned already you and I deserve hell. We never deserved heaven. You couldn't possibly earn heaven. You couldn't merit heaven. There isn't anything anyone could, could do to merit heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ did it all. Christ, the text says, Christ who is, is. Present tense. And fo folks, I can't spend hours on each word, but I sometimes think maybe we ought to dwell on each word very carefully because, you know, there's not very many of them. Isn't it interesting that it doesn't say who was and it doesn't say who will be. It says who is. The first thing that pops into my mind, you know, is to hear God Almighty and the person of Jehovah say to Moses when, when Moses said, Who shall I say sent me? And he said, Tell them I am has sent you. First thing pops into my head when I read that. I see God as the eternal present. With God, I can't imagine a past or a future. He just is. 
But the text says more than that. Isn't it interesting how that in many Christians' lives, the thought is that, well, you know, there was something that really, there was something really wonderful happened 2,000 years or so years ago, you know, when Christ died for us. And there's going to be, uh, oh, there's going to be something marvelous someday when we see Him face to face, you know, while the present reality, the moment by moment reality of the person and the work of Jesus Christ is, well, it's quite dim. Yet as I go through this book, I see over and over and over and over again that continuity. He is. I don't look back to Christ or ahead to Christ. He just is. He's with me now. That redemption is now. The text we've been looking at is not prophetic. It isn't something that we're looking for in the future. It's now. He is the image of the invisible God. And I hardly know where to begin with that. I know from the Word of God that no man has seen God at any time. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. When Moses wanted to see His face, God said that no man had, had seen His face. You know, it's because the human's not interested in, in, an, in a, you know, an invisible God. You know, that, that paganism is, has uh, such a hold. I mean, I guess to some extent we could say that the gods of mythology, you know, Roman uh, and Greek uh, mythology were invisible, but they, but they made them visible in their language and in their images, which was directly opposite to what God told Israel, that they shouldn't make any image. When they built an altar, they weren't even to use a, a tool on it because they'd be building an altar that had the product of man in it. They weren't to make any carvings or any likenesses of God, any images of any kind. Folks, I don't even, I don't even enjoy pictures of Jesus. And it may offend some of you, but I'll go ahead and say it. Uh, I don't wear a cross around my neck. It's not that I, I mean, I, it's, and that, that may take a little more explaining in future videos, but no graven images, none whatsoever. Okay? Besides, he's, he's still not on that cross. I mean, he's not still on that cross. He's risen. If I was going to wear anything around my neck, it'd be something that depicted the risen Christ, not, not a cross. And I don't, you know, I know there are a lot of you out there that would say, well, Steve, now, now you're getting a little, I mean, that's just pushing it a little too far. I don't, I don't think it is. And, you know, I won't fault you for wearing one, but don't fault me for not. I don't think it takes a whole lot of study, folks, to realize that any time that there was something physical, it led people astray. You know, to teach Israel a very profound spiritual lesson. God had them make a brazen serpent and put it on a pole, and then 400 years later, they weren't worshiping God Jehovah anymore. You know, they were worshiping that thing that they had made out of brass. I think we need to be very careful that we don't have anything that takes our eyes off of the person and work of Christ. The original text says, Christ is the image, the icon of of the invisible God. The word here speaks of uh, the uh, eternality of the Lord Jesus Christ. This speaks of the eternality of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. What the word says is that for God to be visible, it's Jesus Christ. But they're the same. The invisible God is revealed in Jesus Christ, the image of His Son. 
And just to make sure that we don't get the cockeyed idea that the Lord Jesus Christ is, is something less than God, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was not only with God, but the Word was the God. That's why he said to Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because the, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the exact image, the exact replication, the mirrored image of the invisible God. I mean, now we know what God looks like. He looks like Jesus Christ. We know how God acts. He acts as Jesus Christ. He's the image of the invisible God. Firstborn of all creation, and boy, has that caused some confusion. You know, there's two words in the, in the Word of God, one firstborn and the other only begotten, which we've got to look at carefully how th that these words are used. We could take the text to say that Christ became incarnate before anything was created, but the text doesn't say that. What the text says is that He precedes all creation so that Jesus Christ is not created. In fact, we're going to soon see that He's before angels, dominions, or principalities. Powers precedes angels because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, with God, and the Word was God. The Word was the God. And one can't deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't see how that any serious Bible student can do that. It's happening more and more now in this final last few days in which we're living. He's the firstborn of all creation, speaking of His dignity, His glory, His sovereignty, His preeminence, His, his preexistence. And each of those concepts can be derived from firstborn. You can't leave the 15th verse and leave it fairly without realizing that the text is saying that Jesus Christ was not created. Now, that might seem pretty obvious to most of you folks, but believe me, there's a large segment of people uh, who profess to be Christian who either openly or insidiously make Jesus Christ something less than God. By Him... My Bible says, verse 16, and obviously the translators have made the, the word in, epsilon nu, instrumental. I think it's locative again, and the word for there is, is because, because in Him, in the sphere of Christ, not by means of Him, we'll have that later. The Holy Spirit, I don't believe, is repeating Himself from the beginning to the end of the verse. In the sphere of Christ, all things were created. All things is, you know, articulated. The second, all things is not. For in him were the all things created, that aorist once done. Those that are in the heavens, those that are in the earth, the visible, the invisible. And so some of the commentators, they've said, well, you know, Paul knew 2,000 years ago. You know, that some things were invisible, like protons, neutrons, you know, electrons, photons, molecules, atoms. Well, you know, you know, maybe he did. Whether he did or he didn't, the Holy Spirit obviously did. But I'm not certain that the text is saying that that visible means the the what they I get what do they call it, the micro creation. Which we can't see. Though I admit that it exists, I don't think they're lying to us. What I do know is that the Holy Spirit wants to make sure that we realize that it was in the area of Christ, the sphere of Christ, that God did all this. That's why we need to, to, to really stop and ponder and meditate heavily on these verses. These are some very... This is some thick stuff here, folks. That's why we read that Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. 
Okay, now now it all now that makes sense. Back in my early days, I, I kind of wrestled with that, you know. But we can't restrict God to time. He is Christ is he, he he's not. It's present. He's the image of the invisible God. It's not Christ was or Christ will be. It's Christ is. I don't think that we should ever get the idea that God was, you know, he's just tired of sitting around alone. And, you know, I've actually had Christians tell me that, you know, what did, you know, or ask me, you know, Steve, what do you think God did before us? And, you know, was he just bored? Is that why he created us? And, you know, and so he decided to create. He just, just decided to try something different, you know, see how it worked. Like he's like, you know, we're lab rats or something. I read, what if God willed to show his wrath against sin? So I have to reach the conclusion that that's one reason God created. There's no reason to have Christ incarnate in human flesh to die in our place if there's no sin. I see several statements in the Bible of a divine purpose in him creating. One is to show his wrath against sin. Another to show his mercy upon vessels of mercy. And both required the person of Christ. I see another reason that he might show his wisdom to the angelic realm, and that required Christ. But the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in your place preceded creation itself. If that doesn't set you folks back in your seat, I don't know what do, what would. The death of Christ in your place preceded creation itself in the mind of God. Because I can't put God in a time frame. So that to me means all creation, not just our solar system, which which is, you know, led me to conclude, uh, as I stated in a video quite some time back, my belief that there's, I stated my belief that there is no, uh, in, in my my conclusion had to be that there could not be alien life that existed, that exists within this total sphere of creation. I, and I feel I can say that with great certainty. Sorry for all you UFO uh, buffs out there, but, you know, all of you uh, that are so fascinated with Roswell and, you know, and all this other stuff. So, folks, it just doesn't it, do, it doesn't work. It doesn't it doesn't compute. Okay, because that would require the death of Christ again. And God tells me that he died that in that he died he died unto sin once, and as he died he died as our kinsman redeemer. No, I don't think there's life elsewhere. I think we're it. I think, and it's just a personal belief, and I don't have anything, any scripture to back this up, but I believe that in the, in the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, uh, I believe that uh, perhaps we'll see it teeming with life. Maybe perhaps even new life uh, of some sort. I don't know. I, I caution myself against going beyond what's written. But I do know that, I, or, or at least, well, I, let me just say I think. I think that the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, they speak of angelic ranks, both demon and angel, more, more than of anything here on earth. You know, the thrones not being Russia and the United States and South and North Korea and Canada and Mexico and Libya and so on and so forth. But of the celestial realm, that's, that's the context. That's also involved in God showing his wrath against sin. Bear in mind it, it, that it, it will not only be men that sin uh, who will receive the wrath of, of, and judgment of God because of sin, but angels as well. You know, because we were told that many angels sinned and followed Satan, and God is showing his wrath against sin in, in both of these spheres 
both the visible and the invisible, the angelic as well as the human. Well, I'm out of time. Uh, I thank you all for your continued support. You know, I ask that you help support this ministry. Your offerings assist me in the study of His Word full time. I appreciate the prayers for health that you've raised on my behalf, and I try and read all of your wonderful comments that you leave, which also add to my strength as well. Until next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.